had happened over that period. So while some things uh, had failed uh, to be followed through, it was a failure in part rather than in whole. Uh, when you say that the system uh, had not taken the lessons in terms of effectiveness, in fact, the system was very, very regularly tested in reality, uh, including to a very major extent in February of 2020, and demonstrated that it was very effective uh, in dealing with real life civil emergencies uh, in Wales. So while I don't dissent at all from your general conclusion that there were things that ought to have been done and could have been done that hadn't been done, uh, I think to describe it entirely in those terms is to overlook some of the things that positively had happened uh, and the successful way in which the system in Wales demonstrated its ability to respond when real emergencies arose. Let me make it absolutely plain, Mr Drakeford, it, it forms no part of this examination to, to question the, the remarkable individual response, of course, of all those who responded in the face of the pandemic. And, of course, it's quite plain that the Welsh Government was able, to material, in material regard, to respond efficiently to the, to the terrible demands made on it. But the fact that it was able to respond is neither here nor there in terms of the consideration of whether or not structurally the system of preparedness in advance of the pandemic was simply not as good as it should have been. And therefore, the Welsh Government was not as prepared as it could have been. Would you agree? I'll put like that, I would agree, yes. Right. Could I now ask you please some questions about links to the United Kingdom, um, a ministerial and medical level? Um, the Hein Review in July 2010 made a multitude of recommendations about how health ministers should meet pan-UK in order to address matters of, of, of mutual concern. Was it your experience that at that level, the health minister level, the relations with uh, between Wales and the, the Westminster government worked well? Uh, no, I wouldn't uh, characterise them as working well. Why what, not? They, what they lacked uh, was a systematic basis for engagement. Uh, and uh, this has long been my uh, complaint about intergovernmental inter relations in the United Kingdom, that they rely far too often uh, on individual willingness uh, to work in that way, whereas what you need is a robust system of machinery of government that brings people to the table for common purposes, whether individuals are so inclined or not. You've referred then expressly to ministers. I was actually asking you about. Uh, I was asking you about the at the health level. Does what you say apply, therefore, to not to all forms of Welsh ministers, so the First Minister, Health Ministers and other ministers, yeah. or does it also apply to the health official level, so, for example, relations between the chief medical officers? At official level, much work goes on day in, day out, in a perfectly orderly and engaged uh, way. And I think you've got good examples in the way the chief medical officers at the top of the profession uh, level worked together uh, as well. Uh, I was trying to explain uh, my long-held view that the United Kingdom lacks at that ministerial intergovernmental level a sufficiently robust, reliable, regular pattern of engagement that does not rely on the individual predilections of particular players either to become engaged or not to become engaged. In effect, a system that doesn't rely on ministerial whim as to whether or not a meeting will take place at all. Well, I, I would give you a good example, if I could. When I became the finance minister, uh, I took a telephone call at his initiative from the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Philip Hammond, at the time. Uh, we agreed that 
day to day. The relationships will be between myself and the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, but he made it clear in that call that at any point, if I needed to speak directly to him about an issue, he would always be available to take that call. That is a good example of where a particular minister with a predilection to cooperate in that way made it clear that he wanted to do so. The system ought not to rely on individual willingness of that sort. There is evidence to suggest that consideration was given at some stage to the setting up of a health minister's forum to provide a structure of the type that you've described. Do you know why that never came to pass? Uh, well, there is a JMC uh, mechanism, the Joint Ministerial Committee uh, mechanism. Uh, it operated very well in certain uh, contexts. It didn't operate at all uh, in others. It didn't operate in the health uh, context and during the time that I was uh, the health minister in Wales. While we enjoyed, I would say, very good relationships with uh, Jane Ellison, who was a Conservative minister in charge of public health and who led the Ebola uh, response, uh, that was absent at the level of the Secretary of State. The, the JMC system has always existed, and it may or may not operate effectively, depending on perhaps the whim of the contributors. But mm. I am asking about a, a particular body, a health minister's forum, which was debated after the Hein review in 2010. No. Do you know what became of those proposals or, or, or why nothing in practice? I would say there was no appetite uh, on no the part appetite. of UK government ministers to establish such a forum. The initiative lies with them in the JMC context. Right. So it wasn't a lack of initiative on the, on the Welsh part. It, 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 the problem lay on the UK side, you believe? Under the JMC mechanism, the initiative lies in the hands of UK ministers. There has since been a review of intergovernmental relations. It took place in 2022. Um, I think it was commissioned in 2018, so it didn't proceed terribly quickly. D do you know whether or not, as, as First Minister, there have been any meetings of the interministerial groups or the standing committee or the secretariat for which that new process provides? Uh, it is a three-tiered structure. Uh, its pinnacle is a council of ministers. That's the first ministers uh, and the prime minister. Uh, it has met once, but not in full form, because there has not been a first minister of the Northern Ireland executive since the agreement was struck. Uh, but the current Prime Minister, Mr Sunak, has presided over one meeting of the Council. Uh, the intermediate tier has the FISC, the Finance Interministerial uh, Committee, that does meet regularly. And then it has another standing committee that has met more intermittently. And then at the third tier, there will be the sort of meeting between specific portfolio ministers, health ministers, for example, could be one. Uh, I, I myself do not believe that that tier has uh, operated in the way that the intergovernmental review mechanism anticipated. It has been, at best, hit and miss. Is that because health is such a party political issue? Why do you think, Mr Rayford? Um, it, it would be wider than, than health. And my own view is, is that where they were pre-existing relationships... They have continued. So there's always been a strong interministerial group around farming and environment and rural affairs. And that has continued to meet under the new regime and to do so regularly. Where there is no history of engagement of that sort, the new machinery has not succeeded in sparking those arrangements into life. So I don't think it's particularly to do with health or the politically contested nature of health. I think there's no history of it in health, and as in other parts of Whitehall, where there is no history, the new intergovernmental uh, arrangements haven't succeeded in generating uh, new forms of interaction. It does appear, however, to be an improvement on what went before. Uh, it is systematic. It has an independent secretariat. It has an independent means of resolving disputes. All of those are improvements. I was glad to be able to sign the document. Good. There is also, um, in the field of resilience, a, a new forum, the UK Resilience Forum, in relation to which the Deputy Prime Minister, Oliver Darden, gave evidence now some time ago. 
Um, there, there have been three meetings of that UK Resilience Forum. The, the Welsh Government attended the first one in July 2021, uh, and it attended the third one in February 2023, but was absent, with apologies, from the May 2022 meeting. Mm -hmm. Do you happen to know why, unusually, the Welsh Government, given the attendance of other entities, um, absented itself from that meeting? I think it's important to say that while it is ministerially chaired, that form it is not a ministerial meeting. No, indeed not. Uh, the Welsh Government is represented by senior officials. Uh, I have made inquiries as to why we were not represented uh, that day, alongside uh, almost a dozen other uh, bodies. And the, the information I received was that our officials felt that the agenda that day was an agenda in which they were already engaging other forums, and that on that day couldn't command a priority in uh, in their diaries. But as you say, they were at the first and the third meetings, and it's our intention to continue to be involved. If all these bilateral or multilateral meetings or fora are to work, then of course it requires the participation of all the parties and effort to be made to attend. I'm sure you'd agree with that, Nick. I do. The final topic, Mr. Drakeford, concerns inequalities. There is evidence that the Welsh government has devoted a great deal of time and energy to ensuring an improvement in prospects economically, societally, on the part of its citizens and its communities. It does nevertheless appear that in the field of pandemic preparedness, civil emergency planning, very little attention was given to the issue of how a pandemic would affect sectors of the community disproportionately and how steps could be taken to ensure that the impact on those who are vulnerable and marginalised could be mitigated. Would you agree? And I should say that it is a, a flaw that is apparent from the analogous papers, guidance, doctrine, strategies uh, in, in Scotland and in London? Well, I should say at the outset that addressing inequalities is absolutely in the bloodstream of successive Welsh governments. Uh, I spent a great deal of my time in the very first uh, assembly term working with, Profita, with Professor Peter Townsend, who was the probably the world's leading expert on health inequalities uh, at the time to get his advice to address those issues in Wales. Uh, I think there is evidence you will have seen from uh, Dr Sandifer, who's given evidence, uh, and the advice of Public Health Wales to us was that while you had to be aware of the unequal impact of a pandemic on the population, it was very difficult to anticipate in advance of the particular nature of that pandemic where those inequalities would most fall. So while there is evidence in the documentation of awareness of inequality and the way in which a pandemic would exaggerate existing uh, inequalities and therefore had to be planned for from uh, the outset, the more granular planning, which groups would be affected, how would you respond to them? You'd have to do that when the nature of the pandemic you were dealing with became more apparent. It just wouldn't be possible to plan without that greater knowledge. I think that, that was the advice the Public Health Wales would have given to us and I think has given to the inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Rave. Milady, those are all my questions. Um, I believe you've granted permission to COVID-19 brief Families for Justice, Cymru, to ask five minutes' worth of additional questions. Ms Heaven. Thank you, my lady. First Minister, my name is Kirsten Heaven, and as, as I think you know, I represent the Bereaved Families for Justice Cymru. I just want to ask you really about one very small topic around some discussions in 2013. But before we get there, can I please clarify some things from your statements about some of the jobs and political roles you've held? So what you tell us in your statement is, is from 2000, you became a special advisor for health and social policy. I think that was to Rodri Morgan. And I think at that time you had some experience of the SARS outbreak. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, we know, obviously, that you were elected in 2011. Can I just ask, where were you um, politically in 2009 when swine flu broke out? 
uh, I was still a special advisor to the Welsh Government. Okay. Were you a special advisor in a health role still at that time, or were you in a different role? Um, I was the head of the First Minister's political office at that time. But would it be fair to say you knew about the fact of swine flu? Oh, I, I, I did, and I uh, attended in that advisory capacity a number of meetings between <coughs> Scottish, UK, Welsh and Northern Irish ministers. 20 to 2011 to 2013, we know that you were the chair of the Welsh Assembly Health and Social Care Committee. We also know, obviously, that there was a MERS outbreak um, in April 2012. Did that come up when you were chairing the committee at all, do you recollect? Uh, it, it would only have come up in this way, that uh, I, I think from recollection, once a term, so three times a year, a minister responsible would appear in front of the committee for what is called general scrutiny, in which any topic of the day could be raised and the minister asked questions. Mm. Uh, that would have been the opportunity for the committee to hear on that matter. But do you recollect whether or not that happened? Uh, uh, without, without looking back, I can't uh, recollect here. But did you know that there had been such a thing called MERS, either then or later when you became Minister for Health? I would have been of it, yeah. aware of it, yes. And you also say in your statement that you had experience of Ebola, and you've mentioned that briefly today, and I think that was when you were a health minister. Yes. Is that fair? Uh, and just to be clear, you became... Seven, I, sorry, I've been asked to ask you to slow down. Sorry, I, appreciate... I know. Don't worry, I, I know you're trying to keep <laughs> to the timing. To get through. Don't worry, I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you off if you run over, <laughs> if you slow down. Yeah. I will. Sorry, I'm just, just trying to stick to the time. Yeah. To be clear, March 2013 was, I think, when you became elected Minister for Health. Is that right? Correct. OK. So, yesterday, Frank Atherton was taken to some minutes um, from the Health Emergency Preparedness Unit, so that's HEPU for short, uh, and these related to a pandemic planning yearly conference in October 2013. They were chaired by David Goulding, who was head of HEPU. Now, there's no suggestion, just to be clear, that you were at this conference. Um, we know that HEPU sits within the Health and Social Services Group and it reports to the Welsh Government. So by the stage of October 2013, I think you'd been in post for seven months is it safe to assume that by this stage you knew about the fact that HEPU existed and the general nature of its work? Uh, I would have known Mr Goulding prior to becoming the Health okay. Minister, so I would have been aware of his work in the unit, yes. Okay. Now, what's interesting about this 2013 conference is we can see that a talk was given by somebody called a, a Dr John Watkins, and I won't bring it up just to save time, but I'll summarise the gist of what I want to ask you about. Now, we understand he's a consultant, or he was then, a consultant epidemiologist in Public Health Wales. And he is telling this conference about how current threats include a novel virus, and he says that that pandemic, uh, that pandemic influenza planning assumptions in Wales must consider that Wales could see the emergence of such a novel virus. Uh, and he talks about little background immunity, that a vaccine may not work or it may not be available. There's then a reference to virulence and transmissibility in the context of the 1918 Spanish flu, and there's also a reference to swine flu. So in other words, he's talking about virulence and transmissibility with the potential for fast transmission and a very high death rate. Now, as I said, you, you were not at this meeting, we, we know that. But given that there's no reference in your witness statement to HEPU or this specific meeting or the gist of this information, is it safe for us to assume that you were not aware that these matters were being discussed either in this conference uh, or in general terms, and that's in relation to a novel virus uh, or a disease X as it's been referred to in this inquiry? Would that be a fair assumption? Uh, I think it would be fair. I was aware of the conference. I've seen uh, Dr. Watkins, uh, the report of Dr. Watkins's contribution since, but I mm -hmm. don't think I would be likely to have been alerted to it at the mm -hmm. time. So in other words, you were not briefed? Uh, not on the contribution of a single speaker at a no. single conference, and I wouldn't expect to be. No. But just thinking generally about your state of knowledge uh, on this, obviously you'll appreciate why I'm asking. It's a very important topic. Novel virus, disease X, it's being talked about as a possible risk in 2013 in Wales. Um, we obviously know that you went on to become First Minister for Wales, you went on to chair the Welsh Resilience Forum. 
Did you, as either a health minister or, or even in your capacity as First Minister for Wales, specifically ask your officials, be it David Goulding or somebody in Public Health Wales, about the risk of a novel virus or a disease X breaking out in Wales and whether Wales was prepared? So did you ask that question of anybody? No. Given your long experience in health and given what you had seen of the dangerous viruses that I've set out, would you not accept today that that was an obvious and basic question that you could and should have asked? I don't think I would accept it uh, on those terms because I would have asked myself mm -hmm. uh, what sort of answer I would likely to have received uh, other than to recognise that there are a plethora of mm -hmm. unknowns out there that you need to be aware of and that you need to have sources of information about. And I doubt that the answer would have gotten me much further than that. But, but the point is you didn't ask the question, did you? Uh, Forgetting already... what the answer might have been, you didn't ask the question. I didn't ask the question. You said to me that was not a reasonable thing okay. to have done, and I was explaining, trying to explain yeah. why I didn't ask the question. Mm -hmm. Well, those are all my questions. Thank you very much, First Minister. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Heaven. Mr. Keith. My lady, that concludes the evidence for today. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Drakeford. Thank you. And uh, next time we meet, I think, will be in Wales. Wales. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for your time.